Hello, everybody. It's The Building Code. I'm Zach Petovich. And I'm Charlie Bertwistle. Charlie had a problem with that intro, apparently. <laughs> well, I thought we were going to... Re- I didn't know we were recording the intro right now. Um, Classic. Didn't uh, know we were on hot mic. <laughs> no, I thought we were going to record the outro. This is the level of professionalism okay. that you've come to expect here on The Building Code. Charlie, well, tell I, our listeners... Uh, What's Gosh, going on? What an awful day on the for building Charlie. Code. I'll tell the listeners. Today we have a very exciting guest, Ernie Goss, who is a uh, economist. Uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about his, you know, his take on what's happening in the economy and in the world right now. Um, he's located right here in Omaha at Creighton University. Uh, right in our backyard. Right in our backyard. We just went and found the the first economist. That well, we the thing get. is, we, th- that may be the case, but it's, it's really a blessing that we have someone like him so it's close true. to home because he really is world renowned. Um, he does, you know, a ton of different speaking, um, you know, uh, appointments in, in podcasts and webinars. And luckily he made time in his schedule for us. So very, very lucky to have him. And I think our, our builders will be very, very um, lucky to listen to him. Yeah. And why, why we thought it'd be a great opportunity to bring an economist on is obviously with the state of the construction industry and in the last two years it's kind of been through some ups and downs and interest rates are rising inflation's up it's everywhere you go and so we're excited to just kind of ask some questions and learn about you know what's what does it look like and kind of how do economists fit into the greater reporting on what's happening with our our industry yeah it's been cool the uh you know zach and i you know took over this podcast late 2020 um early 2021 and we've seen, you know, just a roller coaster of guests on here. We've talked to how people have to set up their contracts from a legal standpoint, how you need to adjust for, you know, the supply chain, how you need to deal with the labor shortage. Um, just a, an absolute roller coaster of ups and downs of, you know, things that you, in the past you haven't really had to pay a lot of attention to. They've been pretty steady. Uh, so hopefully Ernie can shed some insight on, you know, where he thinks this is going to turn around and where we're heading next. And we can start kind of forward looking and being proactive as opposed to just kind of reacting to, to everything that continues to change. Love it. Let's get Ernie on. Hey, Ernie, welcome to The Building Code. We're so excited to actually have you back. You were on episode 62, uh, which would have been a couple years from now. We'd love to get a little refresh, a little bit about yourself, your background for the people that maybe have started listening more recently. Tell us about yourself. Okay, I'm Ernie Goss. I'm a McAllister chair here at Creighton University in beautiful downtown Omaha, Nebraska. I have to shout out for the, the city that we all live in, or the, I think most of us live in. So I came here um, from uh, NASA. I was with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Before I came here, I've worked with the Congressional Budget Office as well uh, while I was here at Creighton. Then I worked with uh, as a faculty member at uh, California State University in in Fresno. Also, I uh, got my PhD in economics from the University of Tennessee many years ago. So uh, I I do a monthly survey, two monthly surveys of businesses, primarily in this part of the country. Meaning about 50, there are twelve states that we survey here at Creighton University. So I talk a lot about that, and maybe I talk too much, but I talk about that survey. Uh, a lot. It's in the press, hopefully, and glad to be on with uh, both of you. And thanks, Nicole, for setting this up. So good to be with you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is one that I've been looking forward to ever since we had it had it scheduled. It was uh, your recommendation, really? actually, I believe. Oh right? You were like, let's get an economist on the building. Absolutely. Absolutely. The pressure's on. <laughs> 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 and, and and timely for sure, Ernie. You were telling us a little bit before uh, we started recording here that you've kind of been on a bit of a press tour. Um, and and if you look, you know, you, you just do a quick Google for Ernie Goss, one of the kind of the premier speakers in, in the Midwest and in in the country for that matter. So very lucky to have you here on the Building Code. Um, so outside of you, you mentioned the the survey that you guys do and. Uh, the speaking, obviously, could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, Goss and Associates and, and some of the work you do at Creighton University? Well, in addition to the surveys, I'm doing a study right now on um, uh, General Motors uh, case. I do legal work also. I was a, I did teach in the law school, a joint uh, teaching assignment in the law school at Creighton University. I'm doing studies on uh, uh, primarily Renewable energy, believe it or not, right now, one the study in Iowa of uh, renewable energy, that would be wind and solar. Also, a CO2 sequestration project with a Canadian firm working on right now. 
So those are those are consulting projects that I that I'm undertaking. I have a small consulting team, uh, Gosson Associates. So I work on that. And principally, uh, it's you know it involves a lot to do with energy. I worked on the Keystone XL pipeline with uh, with Trans Canada Corporation until our new president came on board, which that project ended quite abruptly. <laughs> <laughs> so. Anyway, that's uh, that's do a little bit of that legal work. I do legal work also, uh, and uh, rep- helping uh, defendants as well as plaintiffs. A ah, man of many talents. That seems kind of unique for an you know an economist by trade, right? So you know what I think I'd like to start there. This isn't necessarily a question on the script, but like, what is the work of an economist really kind of getting into? Uh, well. <laughs> that's we're into everything right my, my undergraduate degree i went to school my undergraduate in south florida and uh extreme south florida if i can say that and then i got my in mathematics and accounting and then i got my mba at georgia state i grew up in georgia uh, my first 18 years and then i went i got my i went to the university of minnesota i've been believe it now this is I, i've counted them to see that <laughs> i've either taught or I've been a student at 14 different universities. So and if you, I won't name them off, and I'm not sure I could, <laughs> but I've been at Creighton a long time. But even since I've been here, I, I was, as I said, Cal State Fresno, I worked with them as a research faculty member. Uh, so uh, what do economists do? We dabble in almost everything. You know, my, my uh, you know, a lot of it interest is in macro, but um, meaning study of the, uh, the uh, entire the total economy, if you want to look at it that way, the U.S. economy in this case. But most of my work, early work, was in regional, meaning looking at states, looking at regions. And we, I mean, can you imagine this? I'm an economist, of course. I couldn't have landed in a better place, in a better region, in a better nation than the U.S. Right here is. Because, why is that? Because agriculture is front and center here, and if there's any place we all we economists we talk we say two things supply demand supply demand well that's where it works in agriculture if it doesn't work in agriculture it works nowhere else so uh farmers out there have to live it i study it they live it so when somebody says do those farmers really they know it better than i do they just live it i teach it but i hopefully i do a pretty good job <laughs> doing that but uh, you know, and you have to excuse this. Now, this this is not mine. This is not original to me, but I loved it when I heard it from Paul Samuelson, Nobel Prize winner, winning economist from MIT. He said, well, economists, we're sort of like your five-year-old kid the first time he tries to spell bananas. You just don't know when to, you just don't know when to stop. B-A-N-A-N-A-N-A-N-A. Well, please, when does it stop? That's pretty good. We might have to put that on a T-shirt. Oh, nope. <laughs> you got it. We kind of have a running joke, Ernie. That you know, there's always a T-shirt moment in yeah, the episode. You opened Thanks. with it. Usually, we find it a little later in the episode. So you know, it, it's all downhill from here, Charlie. Yeah, we peaked early. <laughs> I do like. Uh, it, that's funny that you mentioned it. So I, I grew up on a small cattle ranch in in northeast Nebraska, and you never really, at least growing up, I didn't realize how much. You know, my dad and the other farmers do know about the economy. They're constantly sure. watching yeah. cattle futures and yeah, understanding that, corn they, prices. They literally do read the futures market. And, <laughs> you know, most most people here at Builder Trend with MBAs probably don't understand how to read futures <laughs> and things like that. So uh, that's a cool kind of analogy or, or way of looking through things. Well, the Iowa Press, I think is that, no, Iowa Market to Market, they open up by an ad showing what is the most complex industry on the face of the earth. And they come down to it's farming. In other words, you have to know the finances of it, but you have to obviously have to know the production, but the finances that go along with it, forward contracting, uh, puts and options, calls, so on. I mean, no, uh, obviously, if you want to know what's going on there, you better consult a farmer, not, a, not an economist. <laughs> well, it's interesting, too. Obviously, we're a construction-focused podcast, so I, I hear that a lot, too. I think the perception of construction in general is that it is a, you know, you just build stuff and then you get into the minutia of like, well, to actually do it, they have to pay attention to the materials market. And we know in 2020, uh, that 
really started to change. And the last two years have been really, really um, dynamic is one word, one way to put it in the, the construction economy. What's let's kind of go there. Like there's okay. been a lot of change in the economy since 2020, you know, like what have we seen as a result of the pandemic? Um, well, now, first off, I didn't give you part of my background. I grew up in a construction family. Yeah. I'm the only one that got off track. <laughs> became an economist. On track. They're still, my father was a contractor. My brother's, remain builders there in Atlanta area. And what's happened, I mean, this was a shock to everybody. This is a shocker. The pandemic, we all sort of saw it coming. It sort of it was sneaking, we saw it coming this way. And February it began, 2020. And we were all expecting this huge dip in the economy. Construction, principally, construction's always pro-cyclical, meaning it goes along with the economy. The economy, it's hard for construction to grow when the rest of the economy is not growing. So what happened is we had a, a Trump stimulus program that was very timely. Then we had a Federal Reserve that flooded the economy with uh, money. The money supply, what we call M2, increased by 35 to 40% between 2020 and today's to, and then to, and today so what that did was this economy just took a dive a dive a heavy dive not 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 anything we've seen uh perhaps even including the great depression of the 1930s have we ever seen anything like this well it rebounded quickly i mean it, our surveys national surveys all of them said hey this thing's rebounding and construction has can print now commercial not so much commercial has been under pressure today it remains under pressure residential uh i've been doing real well apartments multifamily still doing reasonably well now i'm i i'm looking at if you look at the uh, you know we econ economists are sometimes we call ourselves well i call myself a soothsayer we look in your crystal ball what's ahead doesn't I don't mean to be the downer here, but that's another characteristic of economists. Uh, I think you ask about economists. We typically are on the negative side, the pessimists, the gloom and doom. I had a colleague, I, he and I used to speak together, and he was he was gloom and I was doomed. <laughs> <laughs> it's so looking ahead right now, it's definitely higher interest rates. Anybody who doesn't see this one, my gosh, you need to be. I hope you're a cloistered nun or a a monk because everybody else is keeping tuned to this and uh higher interest rates at least one and a half percentage points 150 basis points on the short end by the october one but construction rebound and look at what happened to, look at the what happened to residential residential prices now construction we're talking about between that date and today uh, it will even no. Let me go over the last year, 2021 to 22. Year over year, the median price of a home in the U.S. has gone up by 18 to 19 percent, and and mortgage rates have gone up, of course, as well, one and a half to two percentage points. When you put that together, the average, the median home, not necessarily in this part of the country, but the U.S., the monthly payment is approximately $700 more per month. You, that can't happen you know, without some serious uh, pullbacks. And that's what we're going to see. In, now, I'm talking about residential construction. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, multifamily construction, not so much. We're going to see people who are not in, going into housing, going into their own house who can't afford it now, are going to be turning to multifamily. Unfortunately for them, rents are going to also continue to move upward, even as housing prices the price of houses softens and even comes down a bit. And is that kind of your expectations of what we'll see? Will it, you know, not only reduce the volume due to interest rates, new new contracts coming in for builders, will the will the pricing of the homes need to adjust as a result to kind of keep the demand of the construction market a little bit higher? Like I think that's I have friends who are, you know, they want to get into homes, they've looked at building right. and they're like, well, the new builder is charging the same as if I were just to go buy a new house. And so it's kind of like, what can I get 
is, mm -hmm. is it's, it's a hard decision for them. And so a lot of them are like, let's wait and for the housing markets to get less hot, right? Higher interest rates, mm -hmm. which will then hopefully correct the pricing to get people into new homes. And will that make building more affordable too, as a result? Well, I'll just tell you what I told my niece. She lives in Atlanta. She said she's been having a difficult time. She's in her thirties about buying a house. And, uh, and I, I just told her, uh, you know, uh, the availability is going to be higher. Mm -hmm. there, going, there will be more choices. Supply will increase. So the availability now, as far as the price, I don't see, we're going to see a, a, a moving sideways but a significant down, like we saw in 2008 and nine, not gonna see it this time. Now, back in 2008 and nine, I have to say my own experience, I bought, I think 12 houses during that period. Cause I'm talking, we're talking about foreclosures. Uh, those homes went on the market and I was buying them sight unseen. I still have, I wish I could bring up the sign I get every day. I got calls on my cell phone trying to buy those houses now. And I haven't sold, I've sold a couple of them, but nonetheless, there I have property managers that manage it. But the prices aren't gonna come down like that this time, particularly on a new house. I mean, what we're gonna see in new construction is just, we're not gonna see much, as much of it. You know, builders can't afford to build in, in, in this market, except on perhaps the high end, very high end. And you're probably gonna see that Toll Brothers or whatever, those that build on the high end, but those on the short end, no, uh, it's gonna be higher, but the availability will be much greater as we move out of houses into multifamily, as we die, as we move into nursing homes, whatever. We got a lot of folks um, that are baby boomers like myself, who are gonna be moving out of the labor market, moving into other circumstances. So. Uh, I expect availability increase. Prices, not as much of adjustment. Nothing like 2008 and 9. Thank goodness we could not. That would be just gut wrenching for a lot of people to see that decline in prices. I mean, building building materials prices are down significantly from what they were a year ago. However, they're still pretty rich there. To build a house today, price per square foot. I don't know the price myself, but it's still pretty high. And so that, that's what we're going to see. I, I see multifamily being a big issue. Here in Omaha, we're see, we've seen a lot of increase in multifamily, a lot of multifamily coming on board. Rents are growing, rents are going to be higher. And so uh, renters are going to be take it on the chin as they have over the last year. Yeah, I'm kind of interested to explore some of the survey work you do to an extent. I actually, before uh, this interview, I just, I subscribed to building blogs and you know posts and i got a an article f about the nhb's sentiment data of, from builders about their kind of how they feel about the direction of the economy and where things are kind of going in the direction and they're seeing dramatic drops in how builders feel about the oh, yeah. the near future and into the next year is your surveys also kind of reflecting a similar sentiment and i know your focus is more on the agricultural side but it, it kind of spans across multiple you know industries obviously um just curious how well, it lines up well we survey manufacturers in uh, nine states and we survey bank ceos and rural mm -hmm. areas at 10 states you know when you add those together it's not 19 states to many states are in both surveys. Sentiment is lousy. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about some of the worst sentiment numbers since the pandemic. And you can imagine how bad it was in the pandemic. But we economists, sometimes we we want to know not how you feel. We want to know what you do. Yeah. And I, I don't care if you're down. Well, I do care if you're down and out. But I'm more important, do you get up in the morning and build a house? That's what I'm concerned about. You get up in the morning and go to work and still, that's the key. But sentiment does have impacts on, uh, of course, ultimately has impacts on uh, consumer spending. I mean, consumer spending, even though last month it was pretty strong, well, strong, if you include, if you strike out inflation, it wasn't that strong. But uh, I mean, I looked at the stock market as we, before we began this uh, webinar and it's like whistling past the graveyard. I'm like, are you out of your mind? What is going on here? And, but believe me, 
you're better off taking much better off taking Warren Buffett's uh, investment advice. Not and Ernie Goss has maybe a little edge in economic advice over uh, Mr. Buffett. But uh, as I have sometimes said, if he'll quit giving uh, economic advice, I'll quit giving economic advice. I mean, he's talking about raising taxes a lot. Now he's quit. He's not so much there anymore, but he was doing that. And I'm like, no, no, no. Taxes are not what we need. I mean, and, and again, I know you, you got many viewers outside of Nebraska and well, but what you're talking about is Iowa responded. Nebraska has not responded in terms of taxes. So in terms of uh, we, Nebraska's taxes are outside the, the, the norm where it should be right now. So we need to see some action from the unicameral, the legislature in the next session. Uh, uh, Governor uh, Reynolds in Iowa and the, the Iowa legislature, they acted. They reduced their top rate from 8% to about 3 to 4 and they're going to reduce it even more. Nebraska is getting uncompetitive in terms of taxes. But back to your point, though, sentiment is not good. And the question is, will the economy match the sentiment? If it does, then we're, we're in one hell of an economic downturn. I, for one, don't think it will match that level of the sentiment. But what we're seeing, of course, is in investment decisions. I mean, think about this. Everybody says, well, President Biden, uh, and I worked on the Keystone Excel pipeline as a consultant. Well, that was not going to increase production significantly, but it sent a message. For goodness sakes, we're not, you have to be an idiot to see, I mean, if you're a, a, a decision maker in oil, the oil industry, fossil fuel industry, and you don't have to know what that signal, that changes your expectations. And you don't, if you're going out and build, am I going to build a pipeline? I don't think so. Are you going to drill more, have more drilling? I don't think so. The president said, I'm on the side of renewable energy. Okay. The American people elected him to do that. He's doing it. Well, here's the outcome. Here will be the outcome. You'll get higher oil prices. Now, that's not what, that's not all what we're seeing right now, I admittedly. But it is, it does change the outlook for those in the oil industry and they respond accordingly. It will happen in construction. Now construction is not, you've got too many players in construction. Uh, by that, I mean, you got some guys and gals that'll continue to build even until they've got an inventory they can't sell. As long, and again, this is my experience from the construction industry. My father was a contractor, a builder. Uh, he, as long as they were lending, he was building. That was it. And as soon as his inventory got too large, they weren't lending, he wasn't building. So the sentiment, sometimes the builders continue to build even with very negative sentiments. That's kind of what I was wondering too, is like just it's the houses even during the 2008, yeah, it slowed down significantly. And there certainly will be businesses that don't survive any economic recession, but generally there's still plenty of new developments getting made. Like the people right. developing that land aren't necessarily the ones who are like the, the stakeholders and the ultimate delivery of those homes. And so they're still going to, they're still going to zone. They're still going to coordinate. They're going to still try and find builders who will build on that land. And, and I mean, is that typically what you've seen in the construction space? Like even in 2008? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's uh, sort of like, and, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Charlie, you talked about earlier about farmers as well. I mean, farmers don't quit farming because of low uh, uh, commodity prices. They just switch crops. They and they try to buy land. They buy land even when prices are low. And that's it's some you know. In other words, you can't be a farmer. You can't be a, a contractor. You can't be a developer if you don't develop. So you're always even with the sentiment down. Who stops it? Who is sort of like who play? Who pulls the chair out from the musical chairs? And there's one chair missing. Five five contractors and four chairs. Somebody's going to fall, and that's what we see. And it's it's the it's the law. Lenders, the lenders have to pull out when your inventory. <coughs> excuse me, when your inventory of homes are, and that's what I'm more familiar with is uh, residential. But even on large development projects, you've seen some of them just cease. You're like, wow. And that's shocking sometimes to see an entire development 
just just come under. What happened? I mean, like look at Intel in uh, Ohio. That was a big pullback. I mean, that was unbelievable that Intel uh, ceased that development that was going to go in there. Now it may still come in there, but uh, that was that's a big turnaround. And and what happens in construction? It's not like in retail where there it's sort of it does it in chunks. So you get some you get some big numbers and 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 I having lived through it for 18 years of my life while I was in uh, my father and brothers were doing it, it, it when the economy turns down construction ultimately will get hit and maybe early early hit as well yeah I think um, some really cool things that that we've seen um, with some of our builders to kind of try to you know stay above the water or keep things moving is just their ability to kind of shift upstream or downstream so we'll have custom home builders that all of a sudden will kind of move into the remodeling market because right. you're not going to buy a new home but you may fix up the one that you have or yes. you mentioned you know the the kind of high-end custom homes those are a little bit more stable and less influenced from some of the macro things and others so can you shift mm-hmm. upstream and and sell to some larger um you know potential buyers there so I think that will be, you know, kind of interesting to watch moving forward is the builder's ability to kind of adapt um, and go where the money is and go where and go where the jobs are. And you're right, Charlie and, and Zach, before the, the signals that I see, and I'm not always right in looking at signals, they're not uh, the builders are not necessarily seeing the same signals. And right now, if before we end this podcast, a uh, webinar, Watch what the federal governors or the Federal Reserve say, not what I kind of, And whatever I say, I don't vote on that committee. I don't vote on interest rates. Jay Powell votes. There are other, the governors of the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee, watch them, listen to them, what they're saying, because they're telling you where they're going. And one thing that's not really affects building that we haven't heard any noise about, any talk about much, is the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. That's it's sort of a like that's too arcane. That's too complex. Well, you better make it uncomplex. You better make it simple because it's going to result if they begin ba- selling these bonds, letting them mature. Your long term interest rates are going to go, 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 go. I mean, and how high could they go? Well, I don't think they're going to allow them to once they see the impacts, they'll slow down the selling of those bonds. But right now, I'm saying you've got to keep your ear to the ground. And the keep by keeping your ear to the ground, watch the 10-year treasury, watch what, what they the yield on that bond. Also watch what the governors of the Federal Reserve are saying. Governors of the Federal Reserve open market committee. Listen to them and, and try not to listen to too many economists. Because <laughs> again, we don't vote. They vote. We don't what? I do think that's a good kind of advice. And as we're kind of getting towards time here, I think a good note to end on would be, uh, you know, your sentiment of listen and pay attention. And, you know, how could you not see this coming? Well, because I wasn't paying attention, that sort of thing. Do you have some good, um, maybe favorite, you know, sites that you go out and, and, and look at that are maybe kind of one-stop shops for some of this high-level stuff that customers could go out and, and could get a pulse on what's happening? I, it, 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 sure. Charlie, this is so darn simple right now. And I, I'll make it simple. Keep, watch the tenure, the yield on the tenure treasury. It's right now around three percentage points. It was one and a half percent a couple of years ago. Okay, when that moves up, that's showing inflations in there. Um, that's a lot of positive sentiment. Okay, when it moves down, if it moves below three to two and a half to two, that's recession territory. It's warning us slowdown is coming. Now the Federal Reserve messes with it by that their balance sheet. What, and that's why you have to combine that with what the governors are saying and what they're, they're they buy and sell bonds and they're selling right now. That influences that 10-year treasury. The short end, your prime interest rate, we know where that's going. That's the funds, that funds rate, it's going, we're going to have a one and one in, a prime interest rate will go to 6% by the end of uh, the third quarter. Okay, so that's keep an eye on the ten-year treasury. Also, if you want to make nine percent, how how many? And I, I probably shouldn't give away. It's not a secret. It's the least well-kept secret on earth. Is buy the I bonds. They're pay, I bought 
you can only buy ten thousand dollars each year but you and your partner you and your spouse can uh, buy ten thousand a year so that's twenty thousand for uh, two people and of course your kids if you have kids you can buy them ten thousand as well it pays over nine percent right now it's adjusted for inflation okay that's one suggestion but that's that's looking that's hindsight that's protecting yourself also the 10-year treasury but keep listen to those governors of the federal reserve uh keep an eye on uh other bitcoin now i don't that's there there was this idea that bitcoin was a safe haven who in the heck thought that it was a safe haven it's not a safe haven i mean it's not protection against anything anything However, I'm not saying it's not it's a bad investment. What happened was it went up with the money supply. The money supply was growing like crazy. And so the dollar, now, uh, before I forget it, I should say the value of the dollar, keep an eye on the value of the dollar. It's it's at some really, really strong levels right now. Too, too strong. So if you're importing anything, it's gonna make it cheaper. If you're exporting, it's gonna be tougher. So if you're in the import side, the export side, watch out for that. But if you're importing, you're going to see some bargains from Europe. You're going to see some bargains from Japan. If that if that car is produced in Japan, if it's produced in Japan, buy here, it's going to be cheaper. Euro, that Porsche, if you get it from, if it's produced in, in Germany, will be cheaper. So, but the exports going to be tougher. Watch out for what's, look also, I guess it's to say, watch what's going on in China. China's growth is now at some of the lowest numbers we've seen in decades. Now they're a big buyer of Nebraska products, products coming out of this sort of this part of the country, soybean, okay, pork. Also, watch what goes on in Taiwan. What happens if 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 tonight China invades Taiwan? Now, it's, I'm not suggesting that. If it did, the yield on the ten-year Treasury would go to I don't know where it would go. Probably two percentage point, two percent, maybe even lower, and that, of course, is a negative signal. So that's the barometer, not Ernie Goss and the governors of the Federal Reserve that actually have voting. Ernie Goss doesn't have a voting. He, I don't have a ballot in that interest rate uh, decision. Well, Ernie, we're right up against time, so okay. we're going to have to call it on this one. But we really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, got a lot of different perspectives on all the things, and and one major takeaway: it turns out the economy is kind of complex uh, in the grand scheme of well, things, right? Yeah. But but the solutions sometimes are very simple. Simple, Zach. So I'm very happy to be with you, Zach, with you and Charlie. Thanks for having me on. And again, uh, I mean, what what I would like to emphasize is these these people these economists have these models. Now there's danger right there. Model. <laughs> The Fed, head of the Federal Reserve of Atlanta said his model said negative growth for the second quarter. Growth for the first quarter was negative. This is the second quarter. For a lot of folks, that's a, already we're in a recession. I don't always believe models. Now, his model is showing a negative growth. I don't think it's going to be negative, but it's not going to be very positive. Do I have a model? No, I don't have a model. I have surveys. I put it all together in this feeble head of mine, and I think I get a pretty good beat on it. My economy is definitely slowing down. Is it? Is the potential for a recession gone up? Absolutely gone up. And people say in the next two years, I'm like, what about this year? And I say the probability of a recession this year is higher, but still, it's still not not what the Atlanta Fed's model says, though. Well. Thank you very much. I, uh, it's an honor to, to, to get to talk with you, Ernie. Um, and we'll have to have you back for a third time sometime here in the, the not too distant future. Hopefully, uh, when things are a lot more positive and we can celebrate, uh, the Atlanta, yeah, I mean, why didn't you have me back last year in 21? Yeah, no kidding. That would have been a great time to talk. I know. I know. I would have been much more positive. <laughs> I just don't, as we're a commas, we're the peaks people as, Oh, what was his name? Paul McCracken, I think it was, said, we take the punch bowl away as the party gets going. In other words, everybody's, <laughs> everybody's partying down. You turn around, where's the punch bowl? The economist made off with the it. They got economist. it. They That's what the back of the T-shirt says. I like that. Who took the punch? <laughs> the front, okay. the front's the front. got the what economist is, and the back is why you don't invite them to the party. <laughs> they take the punch bowl away. All right, Ernie, thanks again. We'll see you soon, okay?
Okay, thanks to both Zach, thanks Charlie, and thanks to Nicole. See ya. We just wrapped up with Ernie Goss of Creighton University, regional economist, where we got into a lot of different talking points about the state of the economic health of the United States. And I'd love my data scientist director to tell me kind of what were your takeaways and, and what did you learn? Yeah, honestly, my, my biggest takeaway was I feel like I'm going to reach out to Ernie right after this and try to get in touch. I'd Slide love into to. those DMs, huh? Exactly. Like economic forecasting, like exactly. It's got some investment well, opportunities that you're interested in. No, expanding. no, 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 no. Not that necessarily. I think that they we potentially have a really cool opportunity for a partnership um, with Builder Trend and and you know his his group over at Creighton. But I also just want to nerd out with them for a while. The the half an hour there wasn't nearly enough. But yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I think one thing that you have to keep in the back of your mind and he said it from the offset is that economists are inherently pessimistic um but that's what they get paid to do you know think about worst case scenario think about risk do you um, think it's pessimism if it's realism i mean ultimately it's happening and so how you deal with those situations whenever people say like we seem doom and gloom but it's like well you don't get out of these problems by just being like, you know, everything's going to be okay. Right. But I think, I think it's a case by case scenario on what the doom sure. and entails. Like he, people need places to live. Right. So he, I think he was really, really focused on the macro, you know, whole, um, U S and world economy as a whole. Yeah. Um, I think our listeners are, are primarily focused on one specific market, which would be the housing market. Mm -hmm. And I think he made a couple really, really, good optimistic points uh in there about you know people continue to need places to live uh people continue to need places to move to people continue to need to be updates on their house yeah um so i think i think it's good to kind of shift through um everything that's out there and, and focus on the things that really pertain to you and then think about how can i control the things that pertain to me um and uh you know I, i'd like to think that our customers and builder trend users have a unique advantage there um, of being able to track all this stuff really, really closely. How are your leads performing? How are your profit margins doing? How much are you having to pay your subcontractors? Why aren't your bids winning? Um, you know, you can control those aspects and you can, you know, pivot where you need to and change things where you need to and continue to be a profitable, um, money-making business. All those consultants we've had on all the, the experts in the construction industry, you know, this is why you build processes. This is why you have systems. This is why scalability is a huge factor in a successful business. You're really investing what you do for future proofing of if there is an economic downturn, which there will always be ebbs and flows that you know you'll be just fine because you have a brand, you have a team, you have a culture, you have a strategy, you have a, a something you can anchor your business to. and ultimately a lot of our builders i think would take they'd bet on themselves with those with those business principles all of this is you know a reality but it's not inevitable yeah. that you aren't successful and I, I like the way he he left things off too of like the biggest thing you can do is just pay attention mm -hmm. right and so ironically enough he didn't he actually has a newsletter that you can subscribe to um, that he didn't mention there dropped in the show notes, but that will be dropped in the show notes. Uh, he, you know, it has, you know, like 10,000 subscribers, uh, and would do an awesome job of summarizing all those things that he kind of mentioned there at the end. So you can keep your pulse on it. But I think if you're listening to, uh, to what's happening and looking around you and, you know, taking the time to plan how you're going to adjust to that, uh, you'll continue to be a really, really strong business and houses will continue to get built. That's right. Well, I'm Zach Watovich and I'm Charlie Bertwistle. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the video. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for exclusive content brought to you by Builder Trend.